Hi there, my name is Alexander Ivey, and I am the Director of Marketing and Sales uh, for Village Camps uh, here at the headquarters in Switzerland. And um, I've been asked by our partners at Study Lab to answer a couple of questions uh, on camera. And that's what I'm going to attempt to do. And I'll just try and be as concise as, as possible. Um, but please bear with me if I ramble a little bit. So the, the first question was, um, what is your school's secret in finding a common language with children that don't necessarily speak very good English? All right. Well, this is this is a it's a very good question because um, at our camps, you know, we at many of our locations we have between thirty five to forty five different nationalities represented um, with many different native languages. Now, um, a very important thing for for parents when they send their children to camp is that they would like them to speak English the whole time you can pretty much guarantee that they will take some English at school. And this actually helps us a lot in our efforts uh, to have everyone at camp speaking English because, as you can imagine, if you're a child and you want to communicate um, with another child of a different nationality, with a different language, uh, a lot of the times the common language will be English. Um, so everyone will do their best to communicate with each other in English. And the best way to learn is to force yourself to be in that situation, um, to use your vocabulary and express your thoughts. You know, of course, our, our, our staff is also very similar in terms of the composition um, as they come from all around the world. And they, too, speak many different languages, uh, which makes interpreting in case of any problems or, or misunderstandings uh, fairly easy. Let's see, the next question here. Your teachers and staff, what criteria do you set? When do you hire them? What are their qualifications? No, sorry, what criteria do you set when you hire them? I would say this uh, This typically depends on their role at camp, um, the job that they'll be hired to do. Uh, but generally, there, there are certain um, standard criteria. One is that they're 21 years old and over, uh, which is different to a lot of our um, competitors where sometimes they'll only have 18 as the minimum requirement. For us, we believe that someone who's 18 might not necessarily be uh, prepared to take care of children, uh, which is why we said it's 21. Uh, for us, they must also be first aid certified. In a lot of cases, uh, it helps if they have a university degree, but we'll be looking for candidates who have uh, experience in dealing with children in in, uh, in various different forms of work. Uh, you know, it, it, in, in certain cases, this will go even further in depth. Uh, for example, you know, for, we, for our Junior Adventures program, which is for children from seven to nine years old, we will be, uh, we will hire staff um, that has experience in dealing with very uh, young children, um, an early education specialist, for example. Needless to say that, that there is a lot of thought that goes into our staff uh, when hiring. Do your programs require prior preparation? Um, this is a very funny question because I will often get asked, what do I do year round, seeing as our camps are only in the summer? And uh, my, my answer to this is, off, is always, uh, you know, we prepare for the following summer. There's a lot, a lot that goes into preparing a summer camp. So when, you know, when camp is over, first of all, we do, we have to, we do the follow-up, you know, and then we have to think about next year. We have to prepare the brochure. We have to look at which, we have to look at the feedback from all the parents, you know, make adjustments if need to. Um, we look at possible new programs, possible new locations, and any adjustments we need to make. You know, on top of that, as I had mentioned previously, we, you know, because we have children that come from all around the world, um, as much as we get the majority of our, of our campers come from, from word of mouth and through recommendation, um, it's very important for us to have a very um, eclectic group of children when at camp. And this, these children come from all around the world, but also through uh, our various partners from around the world. Uh, the, re the way we get this is by working with partners from around the world who will tell their clients about our camps. And, you know, so, so basically the thing that I want to make clear about all this is that we prepare all year round for camp, uh, which is what I believe differentiates us from a lot of other uh, companies that provide summer programs. In many cases, uh, there'll be schools that, you know, don't 
have uh, children during this during the summer time, so they'll they'll create a summer camp. Whereas us, this is our full sole focus. You know, all year round we prepare for the summer. We are a summer camp organization, not a school that provides a summer camp on the side. The top three challenges when working with teenagers. I think the first challenge would be uh, finding a way to relate to them. When you're dealing with children of different cultures um, and different backgrounds, it's very important that you find a way to relate to them. You find uh, that common ground because you won't be able to approach every camper the same way. Another thing would be uh, having the children let go of their high school persona a bit. A lot of these children are high schools and they've got their own image to uphold, but when they come to camp, it's a chance for them to have a fresh start because everyone is in the same boat. And a great thing about being at camp is that, you know, while you're making all these friends, you can also let go a bit and, and be a bit goofy and, and, uh, and have fun and, and, um, and let your guard down a bit. And uh, sometimes it can be hard for children to do this, um, but once they pass that hurdle, uh, camp's a whole new world for them, and it's a great time. I think the last thing would be to, to maybe to get the, the shyer children to participate in all the activities, but our, our staff is extremely, uh, extremely well qualified and extremely well trained to deal with um, the shyer children and to encourage them to um, partake in, in the activities that we offer, um, as well as to, to break out of their shell a bit and, and they all they all end up making friends, which is fantastic. Here's a question: uh, There are many schools that offer summer programs with classes in the morning and entertainment for the rest of the day. Why do you think it is important to give children an opportunity to choose sports, arts, and diverse classes as afternoon activities? What is the motivation for the students? In this particular case, I guess that I would have to refer back to our founding principle. Uh, and motto, which is education through recreation. Basically, that we believe very strongly in learning through the medium of fun, through the medium of sports or um, extracurricular activities. This can also be seen very clearly through our language classes, which are not your classic language classes, but uh, are very interactive, uh, project-based work. And we, we, we focus a lot on vocabulary and the spoken word. And we've seen that our, our, our program actually actually uh, has has significantly better results than your classic language schools. This is why we've we've continued to develop our program as is, and we're we're very strong believers in in our motto, which is education through recreation. Question number seven: What key life skills can such activities slash options give to children? Uh, I'd have to say that the. the Basically, the, the things that they'll develop through this is um, they'll learn through the interaction with the different children, through the medium of sports and the extracurricular activities, is the children will develop self-esteem, um, you know, in the, they'll gain independence, um, they'll develop their social skills, uh, which is extremely important when, when um, learning how to communicate with children or, you know, in the future adults, of, of, they'll also begin, uh, begin networking. You know, networking doesn't necessarily have to begin when we're in university. Um, it can begin as soon as you're at camp and, and, and making friends from all around the world and keeping those friends after camp. You know, I still have, have children that, that I went to camp with 20 years ago that I still keep in touch with. Tell us the funniest story that happened in your camp. Uh, this is certainly a different, difficult question because I'm not... Um, as often on site. Uh, I work at the head office uh, in Switzerland and I do go to the camps every summer to 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 have a look around to make sure that everything's going smoothly but I'm I'm not there the whole way through so I think um, I guess my, the best answer for this would be to just encourage um, campers to to experience camp for themselves and, and create their own funny funny stories and memories. What were the main challenges uh, and what have you learned from them? I think I'd, I'd refer to two main challenges. Uh, one is the languages. So basically we, we impose a 20% quota on all native languages to make sure to keep an international composition at, um, at our camps. Um, this, is, this is really to make sure that uh, we don't have one uh, language that is, that is kind of monopolizing camp and uh, while a children's native language, you know, might be uh, might be French, for example, uh, they could very possibly speak English much better than they do French. 
you know, also they, they may have several native languages. Their father might speak one language while their mother speaks another. So it just makes it hard to uh, determine exactly what their native language is. We do, we do stay very firm to it because um, it's very important in order to keep the quality of our camps. Um, so we, we do our best, um, you know, but uh, it just it has become more of a challenge. Another one would be mobile phones. Mobile phones have, have, have made it a bit difficult. Um, in my personal opinion, it makes it very hard for camp because ch children, you know, phones, phones are very addictive to children. And, and children always want to be on their phones. And children are not the only, the only culprits, you know. Uh, parents these days want to continuously be uh, connected to their children because it's what they're used to. And, uh, and it's understandable because it's, uh, you know, you're sending away your child for two weeks and you want to be able to get in touch whenever you, whenever you, you, you feel the need to. Um, however, the problem with it is that the, the children the children don't only use their phones to text their parents or to take pictures. Um, you know, uh, let's face it, there's, there's games, there's all these different things on their phones. And a child now, instead of, instead of um, you know, having a moment of quiet and, and wanting to go and speak to a friend or a, 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 another camper from, a, from you know, uh, meeting someone else and making a new friend, they'll go to the, to the easiest easiest solution and gravitate towards their phone. In my opinion, they shouldn't be allowed to count, full stop. But uh, we have to be realistic, and in this world, uh, at this point in time, uh, it's very it's very hard to tell a child they cannot have their phone or to tell a parent that, that their children are just not allowed to have their phones. So we're going to have to adapt, and, and uh, that's what we'll do. Uh, which excursions do children enjoy the most? That's the last question I said. I think um, this is quite a difficult question uh, because we have so many different locations. I know for a fact that the excursion to Manchester is a very popular one for our camp in York, as well as uh, the children from our football camp will go to either visit uh, Manchester United Stadium or Manchester City Stadium, and this is a very popular uh, excursion with the children. For me in particular, uh, and I'm a little bit biased because I've done this excursion personally, um, is uh, in, our, in the Ardèche in the south of France, our camp there, they do a two-day descent down the Ardèche River. And one night they'll actually sleep under the stars. And this is ju it's just such a fantastic experience. And I highly recommend that if you're a camper out there watching and you have not yet had a chance to experience this two-day trip, uh, don't hesitate to make this your next, your next camp. So there you go. I, I do hope that I've answered most of these questions um, as concisely as possible. And, uh, you know, should you have any other questions, I'm sure that the, our, our partners at Study Lab will be more than happy to answer them for you. I would also like to, uh, to, to thank all of you that joined us this year. And we look forward to, to welcoming um, past campers and new campers alike um, this next coming year in 2018. All right, all the best. Take care.